Hi, Ben. My name is also Ben. That's about it, though. That's all we have in common. <laughs> um, you spoke a lot about how the crime and a lot of issues in America come with having sex out of wedlock and having basically broken up families. I was wondering your opinion on uh, mass incarceration in this country and how that affects and ties into victimization, um, specifically related to black and brown people, but I'll get there in a second. Um, America has 25% of the world's prison population mm -hmm. with 5% of the world's population. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously a lot of your families where kids go wrong, they don't have the support systems, that's why um, their fathers or their mothers are in prison. And you can look at very concrete uh, examples of ways where the law has not been applied equally to black versus white people. So one example of that is in 1986, the Anti-Drug Abuse uh, Act where they punished crack cocaine, which black people used more than white people, at a 100 to 1 rate, which was recently reduced to 18 to 1 under Barack Obama. Um, so I don't see how you can claim that everyone is treating equally and no one is victimized on a systemic level when you have laws that punish uh, one race that is more likely to use one type of drug more than another race when it's actually been shown that among kids our age, uh, white people and suburban kids are more likely to use drugs in schools than black inner city kids. Okay, so uh, there, there's a lot there and you're right, we disagree on everything. So, um, <laughs> so to begin with, uh, I don't believe in the concept of mass incarceration because that implies that the police are going into black communities with lasso, rounding people up and taking them to jail for no reason. I don't think that's happening. Every person who is in jail has had a trial or a plea. The idea that people are just being grabbed and thrown into prison to keep alive some sort of prison industrial complex where the, the prison masters are the ones running the system, I don't see evidence of that. As far as the 1986 law, I think that it's important to put this into context. And the context is that that law was originally pressed by black legislators from inner cities who are sick of watching crack cocaine destroying their communities. And the reason for the disparity is because crack was more easily distributable and significantly more effective than powder cocaine. It is also the fact that the vast majority of people who are distributing and using crack cocaine were black. You know it's a drug that the vast majority of people who distribute and use are white? Crystal meth. Guess what the penalty is for one ounce of crystal meth versus one ounce of crack cocaine? They are identical. They are identical because they are easily distributed and they are distributed in similar forms. So the idea that this was just some sort of attempt to grab black people off the street and throw them in jail for no reason so we could have a permanent underclass of people with no fathers, this seems to me like a giant conspiracy theory with little evidence to support it. As far as the idea that, that these communities would be better if we just release people onto the streets, so I think it's important, again, to note the statistics here. The fact is the vast, 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 vast majority of people who are, in who are in jail for drug crimes are in for distribution, not merely for use. The idea that it's a black kid who's just smoking crack on the street who's getting picked up by the cops and thrown in jail, the justice system doesn't have time for that. Okay, the vast majority of even possessions that are, pl are pled down from distributions. Now, I've said earlier I'm not in favor of the drug war. Okay, but I can tell you something. The people who are currently acting in criminal fashion in the drug war aren't going to be out acting as model citizens as a general rule. A lot of those people are going to be committing other crimes because this has been the history of the United States. When you make a substance illegal, the people who are criminals were criminals before and they're criminals after. Al Capone was not going to turn into a banker after prohibition ended. <laughs> and the same thing is true for a lot of the people who are committing criminal acts by distributing illicit substances. So I think that to pretend that the epidemic of single motherhood is going to end, all these guys are just going to decide, you know what, I've decided to marry that girl. I'm going to stay home and it's going to be like, leave it to beaver. When they were dealing crack on the corner to 12-year-old kids the day before, I think that's a little bit of a myth. Yeah, I want to respond to one specific point. You were saying um, the idea that cops are going into black communities and lassoing up black people is completely ridiculous. How would you explain the amount of black people in jail currently? Higher numbers of black people committing crimes. Well, that's not the case. That's it is really absolutely the case. Uh, there's, it's been statistically shown that white people use drugs just as much as And black as people. I said, people are generally not arrested for using drugs, they're generally arrested for drug distribution in the drug so war. do white people not distribute drugs? Well, they don't in terms of proportionality with regard to, I mean, the, the, the idea that, again, the, the, you need to show me the statistics on drug distribution. So uh, the, the burden is on you to prove the disparity, not on me to prove the non-disparity. Well, you're the one who's accusing the criminal justice system of, of wild injustice. Again, I don't have the statistics in front of me, so it's hard for me to cite statistics on that particular aspect of drug distribution, but you'd have to show that there are a bunch of white people who are distributing drugs to the same extent as the black people in jail and then tell me that they're not 
being treated equally. You can't just suggest that drug use is equal to drug distribution because statistically it's not. Okay. Thank you. Yo. For the conversation, for me just to shout cuck at people. And this is, and this is, this is why I think the alt-right movement is actually counterproductive. I think it's sucking in young people too, and, it's, and it, it bothers me. I speak on, on, I mean, you know, I speak on college campuses all the time, and I'm seeing there are a bunch of people who, because they're entranced with the fun of it, forget that there actually is such a thing as morality, right? The, the answer to bad morality is not no morality, it's good morality. Uh, Trevor Wieger, University of Nebraska, Kearney. Um, my question, I guess, looking more on a national level, uh, something I've kind of been hearing murmurs of, uh, one big voice, Mark Levin um, in radio, and mm -hmm. also I think Governor Greg Abbott of Texas um, is a big voice for it already. Um, is that Article 5 Convention, yep, convention of States, of states. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Constitution, yep. um, just as a way to bring power back to the states, rein in uh, the federal government? Um, just wondering what your thoughts are on that, if you see that having any sort of success and kind of the steps needed to push that forward. I mean, sure, it's a great idea. I think that the rule is under Article 5 of the Constitution, I think three-quarters of states can call a convention of states without the, without the approval of the federal government, and then, they, and then they pass amendments to the Constitution, essentially, and then it has to be passed again in all of the various states. That's the idea of the convention of states. Sure, I think that would be great. I think the biggest problem that we have right now, I think the convention of states is almost, it's a fine idea. My only issue I have with the Convention of States is that I don't believe that parchment barriers are enough anymore because the left does not respect rule of law or words. Right? The Constitution, like the fact that people are feeling the need in various states to pass Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which basically says we have freedom of religion, I mean, that just demonstrates the left doesn't care about the Constitution. You wouldn't need another bill reiterating what the First Amendment says, except that the left keeps violating the First Amendment. And so I don't think they'll be stopped by bills. I don't think they'll be stopped by amendments. I think the only thing in the end that's going to stop the left is people just saying no and refusing to abide by it, which is unfortunately an uglier solution. But as government grows bigger and bigger and grows more and more intrusive, I think you're going to see more and more conflict between the federal government and state governments. I mean, you can see a time in the very near future when the federal government tries to take away gun rights and the state of Texas says, come and try and take them. Right? And that's when things get really ugly. Thank you. Hi, Ben. Uh, we actually met last month at the... Western Conservative Summit. Oh, cool. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, you too. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, I saw you tweeting uh, yesterday about Obama's speech and how he was trying to appeal to conservatism yep. to kind of counter Trump. Mm -hmm. Do you think that'll be effective? No, it won't be effective at all because he's a liar. But, it, but what he was trying to do... Um, <laughs> I do think that Obama's speech last night, did, did everybody see Obama's speech last night? Did you all waste the time? Good, okay, so you did something useful with your life. Yeah, I know, I was, I was on a plane, and I was like, okay, I can either watch Deadpool or I can watch Obama's speech, and I did not pick Obama's speech, but I did, I did read it. Um, and so, the, the, you know, so, so basically, here's my take on Obama's speech last night. Obama spent an enormous amount of time in that speech pushing language that was straight out of the Ronald Reagan handbook. I mean, he talked, he actually said at one point, we don't need a savior-like leader. America doesn't need a ruler. And I sat there flabbergasted. He's like, what? Wait, you have a mirror in your house, right? <laughs> like, like, Captain Pen and Phone, Captain, I'm going to make the, the, the oceans of the world will recede if I'm elected president of the United States. We don't need a savior. We don't need a ruler. I mean, it's amazing stuff. But what he's trying to do is he's trying to fill a gap that's been left by the Trump right. The Trump right doesn't talk about the Constitution or individual liberty or limited government at all. They talk about problems, and then government will come and solve them. And so Obama's trying to triangulate. He's trying to fill that gap. He's trying to take some of the never-Trump folks and convert them into Hillary folks. It's not going to work. I mean, people who don't like Trump don't like Trump because they're too conservative for Trump in large part, not because they're open to a felon, a felonious congenital liar like Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Hi, my name is Marlene and I go to Rutgers University. And because there's so few of us on campus, we use a lot of humor in our activism. For example, when liberals are protesting offensive Halloween costumes, we protest outside the dining hall and call for a ban on Lucky Charms cereal because leprechauns <laughs> are offensive to Irish people. So I wanted to get your take on humor tactics and the Milo incident, if you want to talk about that. Uh, so which Milo incident? The one that separate. happened on my campus. <laughs> The, uh, the big Rutgers one that happened a few months ago. So you'll have to remind me because Milo is a provocateur. Um, so which Black one Lives this? Matter protests, the feminist group painting red blood on their face to represent menstrual blood and all the oh, other Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's the, yeah. I mean, let's put it this way. Call me crazy, but I find painting menstrual blood on your face off-putting. <laughs> it, it, it's just not my thing. I mean, I, can, I think there's a reason why these, many of these women will die single and alone. Um, but... Oh. Uh,
but don't worry, they'll have their 83 cats to comfort them. Uh, the, uh, as, as, far as, the, as far as the use of humor, uh, I'm a big fan. I mean, I think that one of the big problems that we have in the conservative movement is that we're constantly telling kids to do boring stuff. Okay, go knock on doors today. You know, go to a phone bank. Yeah, you should find out what, what people want to do and then allow them to do it. Do fun things. It's something Saul Alinsky said. He says, you give people things that are, are fun for them to do. For the left, setting American flags on fire are fun until the American flag catches them on fire, in which case it's fun oh. for us. <laughs> but the, But highlighting the absurdity of the left with, with additional absurdity, I think, is always a great tactic. Hi, Ben. I'm Rowan Monkberg from uh, UCF. And I was wondering if um, you have further discussed with Milo the possibility of debating one another. Uh, well, Milo chickened out, so I have no more time for him. Okay. I mean, that's, <laughs> I, that's the end of the story. I typically don't even make a point of reaching out to people who, who, as I say, tweet pictures of black children at me on the day my child is born to suggest that my wife had an affair with a black man and I watched. Like, that, that doesn't typically appeal to my better nature. Um, but you know, I, I thought it was important to try and debate him. Unfortunately, he's a coward and a hack, and he's not half as intelligent as his British accent makes it appear. Oh. And his hair is awful. Woo! I'm Matthew Marsland from the University of Notre Dame. And I just had a question. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of talk in your speech and throughout the speeches today that uh, if government just gets out of the way, problems will be solved. I don't really see how government getting out of the way will stop abortion, how government getting out of the way will curb the tide of degeneracy that's, that's sweeping this nation and, and driving it under the ground. I don't see how government getting out of the way can prevent cultural death in almost every area of this, of this country. So I, my impression is that it is not wrong for conservatives to make use of the state to defend the state, to defend the people in the state from these evils. Well, I'm not an anarchist. So I mean, well, what, so what I would suggest is that the purpose of government, I'm, I'm, I mean, this is, this is a very kind of John Stuart Mill view of government, but the purpose of government is to minimize externalities. Okay, and that means that I, wa I can wave my fist around until it hits you in the face. So when it comes to abortion, that's basic police power. Yeah. Okay, that's a human being in there. You don't get to kill it just because it's in your womb. So, the, so the, I have no problem with government regulation of abortion, obviously, because I think that's a human being, and human beings don't get to kill other human beings, even if they think they have a right to or would prefer to pretend that those aren't human beings in the first place. There's a really long and nasty, nasty history throughout human history of people devaluing other human beings by calling them not human in order to kill them. And I, I think extending that to the unborn is a great sin for which God will, will eventually make the nation pay, uh, as John Adams said about slavery. Uh, the, you know, as, as far as you know, using... Uh, the, the government's police power in, uh, I'm trying to remember some of the other examples that, that you gave, that would be the, the, the largest one to me. Most of these yeah. other areas, like culture, uh, I think that what we actually need are active social organizations. I think that what's happened is that the government grew so large and people in the United States relied on government to basically police everything and our social institutions died. So churches emptied out, we figured we'd basically, the secular church was now the government which would take the moral lead. What we actually need is we need to go back to the, the view of de Tocqueville about how Americans lived, which was we had extraordinarily strong social institutions, which created a very strong social fabric that tied our communities together. And you still see this in church and, and synagogue communities and mosque communities where people have a common set of values, right? That actually is, is necessary. It's a precondition of liberty. Liberty can't exist without these social ties that bind us together. Otherwise, you end up with anarchy. But that doesn't mean the government fills the gap. It's social mm -hmm. institutions that fill the gap. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, Ben. My name is Doyle, and like you, I'm a hashtag never Trump guy, and I was curious to who are you going to vote for since you're not going to vote neither Trump or Hillary. Okay, so l quick preface on the, on the voting thing. So number one, whenever people ask who I'm going to vote for, you're not doing this, obviously, because you're on my side, and thank you for that. Uh, but, it's, but usually when people ask me who I'm going to vote for, what they really mean is shut up and stop criticizing Trump, because my vote doesn't count anyway. I'm in California, which means that I'm the only Republican voter in the state. <laughs> so, okay, we got like two or three others here. We're building a movement, guys. Uh, so, <laughs> so, my plans right now are to vote for neither, and I'll give you my logic. Okay, the reason that I say this is because I fully understand, by the way, people who say they want to vote for Trump over Hillary because they would prefer to vote for the lesser of two evils. I have a couple of, of responses to this particular argument. One, there's the short-term answer and the long-term answer. 
I don't know. In the short term, I think Trump would be a better president than Hillary Clinton. It's my own personal view. Obviously, it doesn't represent YF. My, my, my view is that in the short term, Trump would probably be a better president than Hillary Clinton because it's hard to imagine a worse president than Hillary Clinton. There is the possibility that Donald Trump nukes France because he gets syphilis from a French hooker. I mean, so, that, so it's... So,